Hello squad, today we'll be talking about love. Not the normal healthy love born of compatibility and mutual respect, but the kind of torturous, doom-defying, all-consuming, world-altering, and, dare I say, unnatural love that throws mortals and immortals together. In addition to being an obsessive world-builder, Tolkien was a hopeless romantic who believed that love could indeed conquer all. This theme is most clearly seen in the three great love stories between men and elves, Baron and Luthien, Tuor and Idril, and Aragorn and Arwen. We'll be examining those later along with the more obscure and less felicitous relationships between Aignor and Andreth, and Imrazor and Mithrelas. Today though, we're focusing on the marriage of Thingol and Melian, the one that started it all. The Thingol and Melian story is present in some of Tolkien's earliest writings, and the basic elements of the story really don't change or evolve that much compared to some of the other fundamental legends of Middle-earth. One thing that does change a lot is their names, so remember that Thingol's full name is Elu Thingol, or in Quenya, Elwe Singolo, and during the Book of Lost Tales era he went by Tinwilint. Some of Melian's early monikers include Gwendoling or Gweniel. I will be using Thingol and Melian, but their other names may appear in quotes from the texts. The outline of the story is this. Thingol is the leader of the Teleri during their long march across Middle-earth to Valinor. He often goes ahead to visit his friend Finwë, the leader of the Noldor, and on one of these trips he is led astray by the Nightingales of Melian, a Maya who is… hanging out in the forest, for unclear reasons. Forgetting his people, Thingol follows the birds deeper into the forest until he finds Melian, at which point, being filled with love, Elwë came to her and took her hand, and straightway a spell was laid on him, so that they stood thus while long years were measured by the wheeling stars above them and the trees of Nan Elmoth grew tall and dark before they spoke any word. So, for several hundred years, the Teleri cannot find their king. Eventually, some of them continue the journey led by Elway's brother, Olway, while others stay behind. Thingol finally re-emerges and becomes king of these remaining elves, now known as the Sindar, with Melian as his queen. Melian instructs the Sindar so they attain a level of learning and civilization that's at least comparable to that developing in Valinor. She also creates a magical barrier, the Girdle of Melian, around the main Sindarin realm of Doriath. Thingol and Melian have one child, Luthien Tenuviel, who has her own fateful love story, and when Thingol dies, Melian's power seems to fail, and she vanishes from Middle-earth. Human-elven marriages are rare, which makes sense when you think about the stark differences not just in lifespan but in perspectives between the two peoples. The union of an elf with a Maya, though, is even rarer, and presents even more issues of compatibility. Elves and humans share fundamental traits. They are incarnates, subject to the laws of time and space, the children of Iluvatar whom the Valar may not coerce. Maiar, on the other hand, are beings of spirit, who assume physical form voluntarily. They were present for the creation of Arda, and have deep insight into the history of the world, both the past and the future. Even if we set aside the interesting times these two find themselves living in, this must have been a very curious marriage. It's also a very important one in the greater scheme of things. For one thing, it results in the establishment of the Realm of Doriath. After the last of the elves complete the journey to Valinor, the Valar don't interact much with the elves left on Middle-earth, so it's hard to overstate the significance of Melian's influence on grey and green elven culture. Thingol missing the boat to Amon and becoming the acknowledged elven king over all of Beleriand is a pretty big deal too. I mean, Thingol's no slouch. He was a great lord and noble, tallest in stature of all the children of Iluvatar, and like unto a lord of the Maiar, and a high doom was before him. He's not only powerful, he also possesses the perfect combination of rashness, caution, shrewdness, and pathological self-confidence to hold out unaided against the forces of darkness for centuries. Without Thingol and Melian in Doriath, the elves of Beleriand would be all but helpless before Morgoth's onslaught. Plus, there's the obvious observation that without Thingol and Melian falling in love, there'd be no Luthien, and Luthien is kind of a big deal. Being half Maya, she has sufficient power to save Baron from Sauron, and then break into Angband and recover a Silmaril with him. The story of Baron and Luthien is the turning point of the whole First Age. Everyone and everything that follows, from Turin Turambar to Arendil, from the Battle of Unnumbered Tears to the Fall of Gondolin, ultimately depends on the outcome of their quest for the Silmaril. But even more important than the whole course of the First Age is that through Luthien and Baron, with some Noldoran outcrossings courtesy of Idril and Tuor, all the houses of the Eldar and Adain are united in one line. 
This affects the whole course of human history, all the way down through the end of the Third Age and beyond. And according to some of the wise, this union has implications for the apocalypse. Supposedly, Arda is going to end someday, and the elves are not really sure what this means for them since they are bound body and soul to the world, as opposed to men who, by dying, seem to transcend this condition. Tolkien says that even the elves had the notion that the end of men would somehow be bound up with the end of history, or as they called it, Arda Marred, and the achievement of Arda Healed. And the hope is that since elves and men are all one big happy family now, elves will get to participate in this somehow as well. When you take into account that Luthien is the daughter of an elf and a Maya, it becomes apparent that men, elves, and the Ainur are now, in a certain sense, one people, each involved in the other's fates in a way that wouldn't be possible without Melian and Thingol. The degree of fatedness involved here makes me wonder, what exactly was Melian doing in the woods of Nanelmoth? In an early version of the tale, Melian, or Gwendoling, is playing truant, said to be a sprite that escaped from Lorien's gardens. Her presence in Nan Elmoth is explicitly an unsanctioned one. Thingol, or Tinwalint, is enthralled by the sight of Gwendoling, and creeping closer to her he steps on a twig and startles her. Then Gwendoling was up and away, laughing softly, sometimes singing distantly or dancing ever just before him, till a swoon of fragrant slumbers fell upon him and he fell face downward neath the trees and slept a very great while. Now when he awoke, he thought no more of his people, but desired only to see the Twilight Lady. But she was not far, for she had remained nigh at hand and watched over him. So here it's only Thingol who is immediately stricken by love and the victim of an enchantment. Melian evades him at first, but chooses to return to him. This is much closer to the dynamic that will eventually emerge between Baron and Luthien. In the version of Thingol and Melian's meeting in the Silmarillion, it's not clear why Melian decides to leave the Gardens of Lorien and head to Middle-earth, though we are told she was akin to Yavanna herself, and loved the deep shadows of the Great Trees. Yavanna is one of the few Valar who habitually travel from Amun to Middle-earth to look after things, so the easiest explanation seems to be that Melian is doing something similar, busy weaving protective enchantments over the tall trees she's particularly fond of when Thingol comes across her. It's like they surprise each other, and both are equally ensnared by sudden, faded love at first sight. It's always worth remembering, of course, that the Silmarillion is a composite text that attempts to create a cohesive narrative out of unclear or conflicting accounts. In the Annals of Amun, probably written around 1950, Melian is moved by a sudden inspiration. At this time also, that is, around the awakening of the elves, it is said Melian, fairest of the Maiar, desiring to look upon the stars, went up upon Teniquitil, and suddenly she desired to see Middle-earth, and she left Valinor and walked in the twilight. This kind of inexplicable longing is usually evidence of fate at work. The lit major in me must point out that in all of these versions, Thingol meets Melian in a glade or clearing that's open to the stars, or open to heaven in the 1950s wording, and symbolically this suggests to me that Melian is receptive to divine influence, that Eru has inspired her to travel to Nan Elmoth so her doom can find her. Finally, the account of the elves' march to Valinor recently published in The Nature of Middle-earth includes a suggestion by Tolkien that the Istari, headed by Melian, were sent into Middle-earth to dwell with the elves, which makes Melian the chief of the Valar's ambassadors to Elvenkind, actively tasked with guiding them. In the earlier versions, it's unclear if Melian's ever seen an elf before she meets Thingol. In this version, far from being taken by surprise, she's been sent by the Valar to oversee their development, which rather lessens the romance of the moment. In several other contemporary accounts found in Nature of Middle-earth, though, she departs earlier and alone, warned in a dream, which is more compatible with the earlier histories. As a Maya, Melian has a good deal of foresight. She's been led in on a lot of the important plot twists, as it were. But even among the Valar, this foresight is imperfect, and it does not extend to matters governed by the ineffable free will of the children of Eru. So, while it's clear that Melian is an instrument, or even a victim, of fate, What's not clear is her degree of understanding and conscious participation in achieving this great union between the angelic Ainur and the earthbound elves. My opinion, which is an opinion only, is that Melian knew whatever longing or dream drew her to the woods of Middle-earth had some significance in fulfilling the designs of Eru, though I don't think she knew exactly what was in store for her. I don't believe she actively enchanted Thingol, but I suspect that she made a conscious choice to accept the love that befell her and from the beginning her love was mingled with grief, in a way his was not. This isn't to say that Thingol has it easy. 
He has a high doom to fulfill too, one that requires him to remain in Middle-earth and be left behind by a good chunk of his kin, including his brother Olwe and his friend Finwe. Melian is presented almost as a consolation prize for not being able to complete the journey back to Valinor. It was not his doom ever to return to the Light of the Trees, greatly though he had desired it. Yet the Light of Amun was in the face of Melian the Fair, and in that light he was… content. Nonetheless, many of Thingol's people don't forsake him. He gets to rule his own impressive kingdom in relative security and blessedness for quite some time, and he never has to deal with the regret or longing for Middle-earth that many of the elves of Valinor face as time goes on. Taking a wife and begetting children comes naturally to him, the expected course of the typical elven life. This is not the case for Melian. She's isolated from her own kind, and she's in the delicate position of being a queen of elves even though she's a Maya forbidden from daunting them with her greater power or altering doom. I always get the feeling when reading that Melian holds a lot back, biting her tongue as Thingol charges ahead to meet his fate. It must be hard to be in a relationship where you can never fully reveal yourself to your loved one, for fear of either accidentally enslaving his will or, you know, catastrophically altering the fate of existence itself. And finally, Melian has a daughter with Thingol, which is a big deal for Amaya. Setting aside the quickly abandoned concept of the children of the Valar, Melian's the only confirmed case of one of the Ainur having a child, and this has profound consequences for her. As the Ainur engage with the physical world in certain ways, they become more bound to it, their power dissipating into the beings and objects that they create or control. In an essay considering the relationship of language to telepathy, Tolkien indicates that most Ainur avoid binding themselves this way. The things that are most binding are those that in the Incarnate have to do with the life of the Hroa, or body, itself. Its sustenance and its propagation. Most binding is begetting or conceiving. The Great Valar do not do these things. It seems clear that there was no oxon, or rule, against these things. Nonetheless, it appears to be an oxon, or maybe necessary consequence, that if they are done, then the spirit must dwell in the body that it used, and be under the same necessities as the Incarnate. Mostly, this is a phenomenon seen among evil spirits, who tend to use their physical bodies for the furtherance of their personal purposes, or still more, for the enjoyment of bodily faculties. Sauron and Morgoth both spend so much time embodied that they have a hard time being effective when disembodied. Sauron pours all his power into his ring, so when it is destroyed, so, in effect, is he. The concept of Morgoth's ring refers to Morgoth's similar infusion of his power into the whole planet so that even after he is personally defeated and shut out of the Earth, his influence can't be escaped so long as the Earth endures. Through her marriage to Thingol and the birth of their child Luthien, Melian sacrifices a lot of the freedoms and powers of her original spiritual state. Her marriage to Thingol was like her ring, the binding mechanism by which her power became more physically efficacious even as it passed out of her control. Again, the only examples we have for comparison are evil ones. But even allowing for that, the consequences are not inconsiderable. Of the possibility that evil Maiar could have bred orcs, it is said that by practicing, when embodied, procreation, they would, compare Melian, become more and more earthbound, unable to return to spirit state, even demon form, until released by death, killing, and they would dwindle in force. Of Morgoth, it is noted that by extending his influence into Arda, he had lost direct control of his power, and all that he, as a surviving remnant of integral being, retained as himself and under control, was the terribly shrunken and reduced spirit that inhabited his self-imposed, but now beloved, body. So when Thingol and Melian's marriage ends in Thingol's death, as Melian must have suspected it would, Melian's left in limbo. You could argue that in her grief she simply loses interest in ruling Doriath and maintaining her girdle, but given what we know about the effects of… conjugal activity upon the Ainur, I think she ends up, well, like Morgoth. Not evil, but earthbound, diminished, tied to a body she wasn't meant to inhabit. It's a sacrifice she made willingly, and at least somewhat knowingly, for the ultimate good of all the children of Eru, allowing her power to pass into the bloodlines of men and elves, and uniting both peoples with the Ainur. I don't know if she had the same starry-eyed, butterflies and goosebumps infatuation that Thingol seems to have experienced. I don't know that Ainur worked that way, but it's telling that her name, Melian, means gift of love. She made a gift of herself for the benefit of her husband and all his people. And that's why this is one of the sweetest, yet freakiest love stories in Middle-earth. If you enjoyed this video, make the like button your gift of love. 
and consider subscribing for more profoundly dysfunctional fairy tale romances. And thanks for watching.